Welcome to the Whole Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you become a fat burner, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey, everybody. It's Debbie Potts, the host of the Whole Athlete Podcast. And before we bring on the guest of the day today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the background behind this episode. Dr. Carolyn Ross is coming on as our guest, and she is a medical doctor and specializes in eating disorders and addictions. I was approached by their office to have her on the show, and I thought, you know what? This is a great topic. It's something we do not talk about enough in the world of sports and triathlons. And I find, as I've been a coach, personal trainer, and now nutritional therapist for a long time in the the world of health and fitness for a long time, and starting in college, I was a health and fitness wellness coordinator on campus for the fitness center and we did different programs and eating disorders have been around all through my life with people I know and just everyone we all have our own struggles and I think especially with training for triathlons endurance events trying to qualify for Hawaii or if you're a runner trying to do Boston Marathon there's so much pressure on some of us to lose weight think we'll We'll get faster if we can lose that five pounds, 10 pounds, or whatever it might be. And sometimes we get a little too obsessed, as we usually type A triathletes we are. We take everything to extreme and get a little more, a little too obsessive about our training as well as our nutrition. And I just wanted to bring this topic up today because we haven't discussed eating disorders and different addictions. And I think it's around us people it might be you it might be someone you know and we just don't talk about it and i think really as this podcast the theme is to train the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method and part of that is really taking care of yourself putting the oxygen mask on first learning how to really optimize your health and improve performance by not only how you're training and what you're eating, but also your relationship to food, your relationship to yourself. And we'll go into kind of the background of having addictions or eating disorders. There's more to it than just overeating and binging and purging or whatever, or not eating, being anorexic. So we're going to get into that today and feel free to contact me to get more information on Dr. Ross or reach out to her. I think if you are struggling with eating disorders, with overeating, with uh, anorexia, with bulimia, or any type of addictions, it's good to reach out and get help or just ask for support. And I think that first step is the hardest step. The rest of it's going to be a lot easier as you kind of get to the root cause of what's really going on to create this this relationship with food or your behaviors because it's usually not the food it's something else going on in our life that we need to dig deep a few years ago we did a podcast about what's your why and i find that similar to this topic today is what are we racing for what's the purpose of doing an iron man or half iron man or that 50k trail event? sometimes we need to step back and go okay what's driving me why am I doing this? And make sure it's a healthy reason. And sometimes we need to take some time off, maybe do some hikes, do some other activities. Like I'm traveling to Europe more and taking a little more vacations and exploring different cities around the country and checking out coffee roasters and, you know, doing some different things. So if you find yourself kind of on the verge of overdoing it in any aspect of your training or racing or with food, uh, I think, you know, we should get some help for our friends. So Dr. Carolyn Ross, she's coming on the show, her a podcast, she has books, she has blogs, she's got a lot going on. She's in Denver, Colorado, and San Diego. So check out her website, carolynrossmd.com. You'll find it in the show notes. And please ask questions 
on the podcast Facebook page, The Whole Athlete Podcast, as well as my website, thewholeathletepodcast.com. And please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to the podcast, and leave us a review. That would be wonderful. We've got lots of competition out there to be get exposure to the health and fitness podcast industry. So if you can spread the word of this podcast and share it to your friends and training partners and peers, that would be great. I'm trying to help make a difference in our industry and have people train the whole athlete instead of just the exercise portion. So let's bring on Dr. Carolyn Ross. Thanks for coming on and sharing this important topic with us. Thanks for having me on, Debbie. It's a pleasure. So tell us about you. I always like to start the show lately is talking about what your purpose, your mission, and what's your why. Oh, okay. I love that. <laughs> um, well, I'm an eating disorder and addiction uh, specialist, and I have kind of, I'm not a psychiatrist. I have different uh, board certifications. My boards are in uh, preventive medicine and in addiction medicine. So I come at it from the behavioral approach because preventive medicine is all about how do you change your lifestyle? How do you change your behaviors? And then um, the, the addiction medicine component. So that's my background and why I do this. I think part of it has to do with my own family where I, I do have um, some addictions in my family. And also part of it I think as a woman physician, you know, you're, you're going to get a lot more people who are, um, you know, who are dealing with eating disorders and so on. So that's, that's kind of how I got into it. You know, I think everyone has a story and that's why I was like to ask people first, you know, everyone runs their own business or has their own specialty because they have a, a passion and you know a reason for getting into that area so obviously this is very specific in eating disorders so you did you find that it you know not just with family and yourself but did you find that this is an area that wasn't being addressed enough in our industry in our society yeah i do think that there aren't very many physicians like myself when i started there were hardly any women in the field at all and most of the patients are women were women at that time so that, you know, was a, a big cue for me that it might be something worth doing. And beyond that, I just think that the complexity of eating disorders and addictions and the fact that they are behavioral and so many people, so many physicians um, don't have training in how to treat them. And so therefore they feel a little uncomfortable with that. So you are based out of La Jolla, San Diego, and then right. Denver. How'd that come about? I'm always trying to figure out how to live in San Diego half the year in <laughs> Arizona. You have to be very, very clever. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, I was living in Denver and started to have some health issues related to the altitude, but I still wanted to keep my practice going. So I actually moved to San Diego. And luckily, I was very fortunate to hit the uh, benefits of the housing market in Denver and was able to sell my home and that kind of gave me a stake to get started in, in uh, San Diego. But I ended up buying another house there anyway, because again, it's just such a, you know, it's, it's a good place to be. And my granddaughter was there and so on. Um, so for the last two years, I've been commuting back and forth between Denver and San Diego. Now, do you go a month at a time or how long do you stay in each? Yeah. Uh, the first year I went almost every month and I would go a, a week every month in Denver and the rest of the time I would be in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's gotten maybe like every six weeks now. Um, yeah. So, but I've been doing it for two years and it's, you know, it's worked really well and it's enabled me to, you know, keep in touch with my patients in Denver. And then the rest mm -hmm. of the time I see patients via telemedicine. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So yeah. we're just, if you guys want to learn more, we'll put it all in the show notes, but Carolyn Ross MD.com is where her uh, information is on her website. And I want to dive in today about athletes and endurance athletes. We're going to focus more on triathlons, but it is any sport. I'm sure eating disorders and 
different types of eating disorders and, and any addictions are really common, but as I said earlier, not spoken about. Because I know exercise, if I've worked with as, as a personal trainer and a coach for years, a lot of people that have um, addictions and they turn to exercise to alleviate another addiction. So I think, you know, yeah. if you have that addictive personality, you need to fill that void, that natural high of endorphin drugs that people get from exercise that there's a lot of addictive personalities in our sport, but also the the importance of being race weight and lean and smaller and lighter for triathlons and for running races and whatnot and cycling. So talk well, there, about what yeah. you've learned. That one of the things I've learned is that there are other common, uh, you know, common characteristics between um, athletes with addiction, and many of them have the same underlying causes of addiction that people who are not athletes have, which is some kind of history of trauma, abuse, or neglect, and trauma being defined as you know just losing that sense, an experience where you lose a sense of yourself like an essential part of yourself, a sense of safety or peace or security. You know, I've talked to people recently who uh, went through an earthquake or, um, you know, were adopted or abandoned when they were children. And these kinds of things can uh, make it more likely that you have, uh, that you turn to addictions, including exercise addiction or compulsive exercise and eating disorders. And just as you mentioned, sports that emphasize making weight, you know, or have, you have to have a certain body type, they tell you, uh, like gymnastics or diving, wrestling, uh, ballet has been traditionally one. Those are sports that are likely to either attract or trigger an eating disorder in a vulnerable individual. And I think it's also sports that focus on the individual performance rather than the team performance uh, can, can uh, trigger eating disorders. Compulsive exercise is often found in people who do endurance sports like track and field and swimming and running. And, you know, many athletes feel that if they're leaner, they're slimmer, if they're lighter, I know this is particularly true of some types of speed, skate, uh, speed skiers or jumpers in the ski industry. Um, they feel like that will improve their performance. Yeah, I think a lot of people do that. Think if I you know, lose five yeah. pounds before the race day, I'll be able to be faster. And often that's true in triathlons, but I think the way people do it and also that short amount of time that they have that you know, I have to get ready for my reunion kind of way of thinking that this guy okay, have one week to lose 10 pounds and they go to drastic yeah. measures. Yeah. And, and we see that in jockeys a lot, you know, that, that they have to make weight and they go through extreme measures to try to lose weight. I think the other thing that comes up is if you've been an athlete since you were a child and, you know, there's so many children now who are not only do they just play sports recreationally, but they're being pushed by their parents to get, you know, they, they do the city team and then they do, uh, I don't know what you call it, tutoring on the side with the trainer and then they have another sport they're involved in. So they're like working out a lot for, you know, a kid. And one, one thing that happen, can happen is as the child grows, their body changes. And this is particularly true for women that, you know, as they mature, their body will have more naturally have a little more fat and be more curvy less thin and that can be disconcerting if you have a coach who's telling you you know you're too fat or you need to lose weight yeah and I think there's just so much pressure in every sport that you feel that way so what's let's go into what the definitions of you know binge eating disorder is on your website here let's talk about that because I think that's what a lot of people would start with or I don't know maybe it's anorexia that you don't eat at all mm -hmm. and kind of go into what the definition and symptoms okay. are sure well binge eating disorder was add, added to the um, DSM-5 in 2008 so it's actually, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years that we've had that diagnosis. But basically, binge eating disorder involves eating a large quantity of food in one sitting, usually a two-hour period. 
And so the person who engages in binge eating usually does it, you know, two to three times a week, and they feel a lot of emotional distress associated with the overeating and the binging. Um, they may eat in isolation because they're ashamed of how much they're eating. Um, and so these are some of the, the traits that we see in, in binge eating disorder. Uh, for anorexia, and, and so binge people with binge eating disorder can be any weight. It doesn't, you don't have, I know a lot of people think that, oh, if you have uh, binge eating disorder, then you must be overweight or uh, you must be living in a larger body. But actually, it's not true. I mean, I've seen women who I would have identified as anorexics who, because they're underweight, but really had all the symptoms of binge eating disorder. So hmm. it's uh, not uncommon. And the other parts about the eating is that the eating may be more rapidly than normal and people are eating until they're uncomfortably full and eating when they're not physically hungry. And then there's that sense of disgust or depression or guilt after a binge. So the criteria requires that you have, that you binge at least uh, once a week on average for three months and that you not engage in purging, which we see with bulimia. Hmm. Yeah. I I would think a lot of people would do more of this as a closet eater because there's so much pressure. And I know a lot of parents will put yeah. pressure on kids to look a certain way as well as their peers. But I've heard of clients that I've worked with people that feel like, okay, I can't eat like that in front of public or in front of family because I'm, you know, I was like this when I was younger too, because everyone thought it was so healthy. So if I ate anything, that wasn't on my healthy list, people would make such a big deal about it. Then I feel like, yeah. okay, you feel ashamed that you're not able to eat that bite mm -hmm. of something or someone's dessert without being, oh my gosh, you're eating that. And you just yes. feel like, okay, I can't eat that. I'll go home and I'll have it when I'm by myself. Or Yeah, you know, exactly. You that, that happens. drives people. Yeah, I think that happens to a lot of people and uh, I'm, I'm sure to many athletes as well. And then, you know, then there's the other end of the spectrum where you have people who just get so anxious around food and they feel that need to really control and they can be diagnosed with anorexia. So for anorexia, it's really, you know, restricting what you eat and you're leading to a, a low body weight. Uh, compared to other people your age and sex, et cetera. And then, you know, anorexics just have an intense, intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, even when they are underweight. And you'll see a lot of, you know, issues with, uh, like some of the signs could be trying to hide how thin you are by wearing layers, and then just the enormous preoccupation with weight and food and calories and fat grams and so on and so forth. So, well, that's what I, I start to wonder. I mean, I'm in uh, as a nutritional therapist and in these different forums that people are into the low carb, high fat, which you know, I find is effective for most people and keto for some people. Yeah. But I find so many people, it's just a, another diet to me. If you get too much in a, a different way of counting carbs that you get fixated on what you're eating instead of just, yes, we should eat, you know, more vegetables and good healthy fats, not be afraid of fats. And I just think afraid of, you know, how do you teach people what's good to eat for them metabolic type or their, you know, their bio individual, but how do you get it so they don't get fixated on counting those calories and using those apps, counting their carbs and, mm -hmm. and tracking their macronutrients without being obsessive with it. And I get, I mm -hmm. kind of see that happening with more of groups I follow on Facebook that it's like, are you enjoying your food each day? Are you right. just fixated? Am I getting everything I need to get? I'm counting how long I can eat until I, you know, intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do this and that, but I still, I'm afraid we're taking it to too serious that you're making it another type of addiction in a way, an eating yeah. disorder in a different type. Well, you know, they have a name for that and that's orthorexia, which oh, yeah. is, you know, another, it's not in the DSM-5, but we're seeing a lot of people with that where they're compulsively checking ingredients and nutritional labels and then they're worried about 
eating clean or eating healthy foods, and they, you know, they restrict themselves to that only a small set of foods that they are considering healthy. And then if they if they can't get those foods, they get freaked out and you know, and you see them in many of those blogs that you're talking about. That's one of the characteristics of orthorexia that people are found in those blogs where they're constantly talking about that. So how do you get around that? Well, I think, first of all, working with, you know, a a registered dietitian or nutritionist to really just develop a structure that they can try to in the beginning and to really focus more on helping them to be in their bodies and to identify their own cues for hunger and satiety. Um, But, you know, oftentimes, and I'm sure that's all stuff that you do, but oftentimes people actually need to go into treatment if it's severe enough where they can have more intensive therapy. And I think the biggest thing that many people miss is just recognizing that that obsession about food is not about food and it's not even about what you weigh. It's often a cover for other things that are coming up, whether they be trauma or stresses in their lives or anxiety and depression that's untreated and so on. So I think it's important to not just treat the food component. You know, if if that's what you do, then you wanna, you know, that want people to work with other people who can deal with the therapy part so that they can actually begin to understand what's beneath their behaviors. So I was just looking, showing on uh, your website, you have the tab that you may be at risk for the binge eating, but the depression, anxiety, bipolar, uh, being growing up, being bullied about your weight, trauma or loss, emotional, physical abuse, sexual trauma, substance abuse. So I keep hearing a lot in nutritional conferences this past year about trauma or, you know, a lot of things that we haven't, um, forgiveness or things that are inside of us that come out into different forms of, you know, health issues or addictions that do you find that you have to work with more counseling as like what, what's -hmm. really going on, peel off the layers, as I say, like an onion, we also get to the root cause. And a lot of it could be emotional, something abusive, just emotional issues growing up or whatever trauma they had. What yeah. You- and and I, I think that's important to recognize there's more recognition about the impact of trauma on eating disorders now than ever. And I think uh, athletes, pr- professional or elite athletes have their own types of trauma where they may have been abused by a coach. You know, I have a friend who's a dancer and in, in middle and high school, she uh, experienced ex- a lot of uh, emotional and verbal abuse from her coach. And that coach was eventually fired because uh, so many of the young girl's parents complained. Uh, but that's, I, I hear that a lot. I hear it where a soccer coach will be abusive towards the, you know, the athletes. Or, and I'm sure you've seen that as well. So that's a form of trauma. And that needs to be addressed. But many times there's also trauma in the family where the family members, like a a father who's living through his son, maybe he didn't make it to the NFL and he expects his son to make it to the NFL. And so there's a lot of, you know, high expectations and a lack of a sense of acceptance for just who I am. You know, I can't be accepted unless I'm following your dream. And that's dramatic too. So I think it's important to notice that trauma is not just about being abused or sexually abused or any, all of the things we usually think of, but trauma can be anything that disrupts your sense of security or your sense of safety. And that can then lead to some of the behaviors we've been talking about. So looking at what type of treatment do you do with people when you're, they come reach out to you, which I think the hardest thing is like any addiction first step. It's the 12 step program, right? And it's finding that admitting that you have a problem. Right. It, I think that'd be hardest part of getting someone to get to treatment. And then how do you, what do you do with people to get them through this? Yeah, I have a five um, step program and I have a, I'd love to 
offer to your listeners a free copy of the ebook, which is a tiny little five page ebook that goes into more detail. But in my five step approach, it's really about helping people stop their behavior so then they can have some space to look at what's underneath the behaviors and then to address the emotions that are associated with the behaviors and that also drive the behaviors. So if you're a binge eater, you know, before you go to, to, you know, your next binge, you're feeling something that you want to then use food to numb or food to comfort and, and so on. So it's, it's addressing the emotions that are driving the behaviors and then addressing how you feel like you may feel guilty and ashamed and so on after you have a behavior. Uh, the next, the third step is um, addressing the body sensations and kind of reconnecting with the body so that you can develop, uh, so you can make the best of the intuitive guidance that your body offers and be able to heal the trauma that lives in your body. Because they, you know many trauma uh, specialists feel that uh, trauma is is kept in held in the body, so it needs to be healed through the body. And the next thing is to identify core beliefs that are usually formed when you if suffer abuse or neglect or, you know, all the things we've been talking about. And people form these beliefs of, well, you know, I'm not lovable unless I'm, you know, winning, or I'm not, you know, I'm not worthy unless I win the medal. All of these kind of core beliefs drive you to feel a certain way and then to behave a certain way. And then finally, the last and fifth step is um, really reconnecting with your authentic self, the essence of you that never changes from when you were born, mm -hmm. and allowing that then to help you um, kind of reshape your life. Now, that seems like that would be... A long process for people. What's the timeline for that? Is it kind of yeah, very every, person to person? It's funny because everybody asks that question. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is, um, the National uh, Association of Drug Abuse has defined addiction as a chronic brain disease, and eating disorders are considered addictions. They're called process addictions uh, because it's an addiction to a behavior, not to a substance. Mm -hmm. But they are chronic brain diseases. So if you think about it that way, you have to recognize that, you know, yes, it takes a long time to heal. That doesn't mean that you won't have relief from your symptoms, but if you don't continue, like a lot of people just stop using drugs or they stop binging and purging, which is hard enough. And then they think, oh, I'm done. I'm, I'm good. And that, that's when they relapse, you know, over and over until they have to recognize that, you know, you really do have to go deeper. That's why those five levels are so important because you can kind of gauge where you are by looking at the levels and saying, you know, how am I doing with my emotional regulation? How am I doing with my behaviors and so on? Yeah, I would think that would be different for each person if they're able to go that deep. I would think some people I've known, you know, work with that it's really hard for them to get in touch with yourself that deep of level would be yeah. a big process and it'd be a huge breakthrough when it does happen. Yeah. I, I, th I think maybe I shouldn't use the word go deep because it does frighten a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I have, I have found that it's really the minority of people who are unable to go deeper, but it is also a minority who really go to the deepest level possible and transform their addiction uh, completely. That's that's another minority. So they're in the middle. There's a you know, like a whole curve of people who can go deep enough to gain insight into their behaviors and and uh, change change their lives. So with endurance athletes, I think you know just that constant. Probably there's a lot of people out there addicted to exercise and over exercising because especially in triathlons we swim bike and run three four sessions of each per week so you're doing a lot of exercise plus if you do strength training and yoga and whatever yeah. else but it's it's a lot of time commitment i think a lot of people are inter interested to learn about what the numbers are if there's anything of that of how many people have a struggle with eating disorders if it's more anorexia or if it's binge eater kind of what is out well, I, there for athletes. 
Yeah, I can tell you about anorexia and bulimia. I don't know that there have been as many studies yet on um, binge eating disorder. Um, but for anorexia, uh, uh, about 35% of female athletes are diagnosed with anorexia and 10% of males. And then for bulimia, it's 58% of female athletes and 38% of male athletes. But I'm sure that for binge eating disorder, it's even higher because just in the general population, um, you know, the binge eating disorder is more prevalent than anorexia and bulimia combined. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that, um, you know, that binge eating disorder is going to be pretty high in athletes as well. Yeah. Yes. I just know there's, you know, so much focus on what to eat for performance and what not to eat, but I'm sure it can, people that have that addictive personality and it can really cause a different type of problem with performances are overly obsessive focus on nutrition in a, a negative way, not a beneficial way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you raised the point about nutrition, and I really think that that's something important because as an elite athlete, it's really important that you have good nutrition. If you don't, then for women, they can lose their menstrual cycle, and then they can also have, and men can also have um, osteoporosis, so the bones mm -hmm. become thin, and that can cause stress fractures and you know bone loss and so on. So nutrition becomes the most important thing and, and that can be a good thing and it could be also be a trigger for people to you know go into an eating disorder behavior but I think it's an important focus if it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. hmm. So talk about your books you have lots of stuff going on your website I see you've written many books books and yeah. CDs and then talk about your your programs you offer. Sure. I just wanted, I, I did remember one last thing about binge eating disorder, and I, I uh, found the statistic is 25% of female college athletes and 20% of male athletes have some type of eating disorder um, overall. So that's kind of the overall number, but mm -hmm. still, no, I don't have a specific number for binge eating disorder. Yeah. I'm sure it's not, I mean, how many people are going to come to admit that they have a binge <laughs> problem or anorexia? Yeah. You know, I be, think yeah. it's hard to get accurate numbers when you're surveying that. Yeah, but sometimes it's impossible not to notice because, you know, yeah. people are changing in size or they may ha have be found with food or, you know, vomit in their room. So it does come out in the wash eventually. But uh, yeah, I have, I have a, three books on eating disorders. The first one is on binge eating disorder and compulsive overeating. The second one is on um, emotional eating. And while emotional eating is normal for all of us, all of us do it, uh, unless we have extremely high levels of willpower, <laughs> uh, it can become problematic and it can cause people to feel uh, shame and guilt and, mm -hmm. and suffering. And then the third book is on food addiction. And I always say that um, I don't believe food is addictive at all. And so I, I want to be clear that my book on food addiction really is about helping you to understand how you use food mm. to deal with emotions and trauma and, you know, et cetera, all the life situations, stress, and uh, how that can then, then become in, an addictive phenomenon, an eating addiction, so to speak. Is that similar to people with drug problems, like someone addicted to painkillers or sleep pills, or is it similar that this just what are you covering up? Why are you taking yeah. those? Yeah. So the the new catchphrase is instead of saying to drug addicts and alcoholics, "What's wrong with you?" Which you know, drug they say that to themselves too. Why can't I get it together? What's wrong with me? Um, we want to shift the conversation to talking about what happened to you mm -hmm. because even though not every addict, not every traumatized person becomes an addict, every addict has had some kind of trauma in their lives. So when you look at that, you know, we really need to address like, how are we helping people heal from their traumas and then work, you know, we have to work on the, the drug abuse or the alcoholism, but we really also need to work on, the trauma. 
It seems similar, but you know, totally different areas of opportunity. But in nutritional therapy as practitioners, we work with helping people find the root cause to their unexplained symptoms. So if someone's, you know, a doctor, naturopath, whoever they thought, you know, they give them all these hormone medications. Well, we're going to look at, you know, why are your hormones imbalanced? Let's look at what the root cause are you not digesting your proteins and, and eating enough protein and fat and make digesting it so you can make your hormones and going backwards. So it think, sounds like, you know, looking at what's happening rather than here's some medication to take to deal right. with your addiction for alcohol, drugs, or eating disorders, take this antidepressant, deal with it. And it's just another way of putting a Band-Aid on it. So Correct. it sounds yeah. like a similar approach that we're, let's go, you know, peel off those layers, figure out what's going on inside of you, working from what I would say the inside out, figure yeah. out what, what are you running from? What's causing this distraction or this, you know, dysfunction yeah. in your body or addiction for this situation? Yeah, I totally agree. I think, um, it's too easy to put the Band-Aid on. And, yeah. and m many times people, that's what people ask for. And sometimes you have to start with that. You know, I don't particularly uh, enjoy prescribing antidepressants for people. But sometimes that's all they'll accept. And so, so you meet them where they are and continue mm -hmm. to educate them yeah. about, you know, these layers that need to be peeled back. And eventually, I have felt that eventually they do understand and you know, sometimes life throws them another curveball and then they get to see some of those layers more clearly. So they always have to have that, you know, temporary band aid and then, you know, meet your body where it's at. Yeah. And then come to me, I'm here for you. Come to me when you're ready or when you feel like you've got to a different level that you need, they'll reach out to you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because we can't make people do anything, that's for sure. No. So no. <laughs> speak, definitely... speaking of, um, speaking of trauma though, I, I wanted to mention that I have a symposium on Facebook coming up on trauma, food and the body. Wow. That's a good one. Yeah. It's going to start the, I think it's the week of, uh, it's next week, the week of the 22nd or is that the 23rd? Um, I think it starts on the 23rd and goes that whole week. So there are going to be four mini webinars on various topics and then a, uh, a podcast uh, on trauma. So I think it's going to be very interesting and I can give uh, your listeners, uh, if you want to take access to that, I can give you kind of the link to the page. Yeah, we can add it in our show notes. So if people okay. go to the wholeathletepodcast.com or under the podcast notes there, you can see, we can put the okay. link in there. But yeah, sure. I think that's a growing area I do, obviously, because you're doing a, a seminar on it online. But I think, you know, I, I do keep hearing that nutritional therapy conference is a lot on that. Another yeah. conference I went to, fitness convention, they even brought it up in a nutrition seminar. But trauma and relationships to food and other areas in life seems like something huge. to look at. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. Well, good. And then people can find you. We've got their website put up. And yeah. you've got podcasts and books and blogs and all sorts of information to find you and learn more. Sure. And I'm at carolynrossmd.com. And I, I also, um, if you go to my website, you can download a free meditation that will help you with your stress and trauma. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I see that on the site. So sign up. I'll have to sign up on that. I need to know if you can <laughs> learn yeah. how to slow down my mind. It's just that it's, my mind all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. Well, good. Thanks for coming on today. And Thank we're both you, in hot weather days, so none of us are pouring sweat down talking. <laughs> so. yeah. Thanks for listening to the Whole Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at wholeathletepodcast.com. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.